All right. Uh, a true disciple of Christ. Now, Christ told us in the Great Commission, he says, go out and make disciples of all people. He didn't say go out and get, get your clipboard and, and say, Jesus died on the cross, I'm a sinner, I asked him, and just, hey, check, 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 sign your name and forget about him. It's not like signing up for heaven insurance, you know. If I sign my name to this, then I don't have to think about it or worry about it for the rest of my life. He said, make disciples. Not just, there's no such thing, you know, people talk about super Christians. I've never met a super Christian. All I've met is sinners saved by grace. And each one of us is called to be a disciple, meaning a follower of Jesus Christ. Where he goes, we follow. What he tells us to do, we read it in Scripture. And we say, Lord, I want to be obedient to that. Now you're thinking right now, well, what if I'm not obedient for that? Well, that's what the cross is for, right? We're not Christians because we're perfect followers. We're Christians because we've taken the blood of Jesus Christ. But now Jesus says, come and follow me. So where he goes, we want to follow. And this is what being a disciple is all about. And don't think of disciples as super Christians because he said, go out and make disciples of all people. A disciple is just a, a regular person like you and me who has uh, said, I'm no longer the captain of my life. I, I, I'm no longer the king of my life. I've surrendered to the Lord. His will be done. Isn't that the, the prayer, the Lord's prayer? Father, just like in heaven, your will be done right here, right now. And so, and so to be a disciple, we want to we put down our weapons. We want to stop fighting with the Lord, right? I'm not going to argue with God anymore. I'm going to say yes to the Lord. So we're in Luke chapter 14, and we're going to look at 25 through 33. And it's a very, very difficult passage. And as I read what Christ said, I want you to do something a little unusual. I want you to keep in mind that Christ actually meant it to be difficult. Because when we come across these difficult, challenging passages of Christ, I know the temptation. I have it too. How can I interpret this to take all the sting out of what Christ was saying? How can I interpret this in such a way that it, it, what Christ is basically doing is winking and saying, go on as usual. I'm not calling you to anything difficult. I'm not ta- calling you to deny yourself. I'm not t- calling you to get out of your comfort zone. Carry on as usual. What if Christ actually meant what he had to say? So as I'm reading, I want you to think about that. Christ actually meaning what he has to say. So Luke chapter 14, 25 through 33. We hit on a lot on this uh, last week. Okay, from verse 25. Everybody there? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. And I, and I wonder, and the Bible doesn't say, did he turn to him and go like this? Or did he turn to him and kind of smile? Uh, but it was kind of dramatic. He's not standing one place preaching. He's walking along. There's this huge crowd following him. Why are they following him? What are all these people wanting from Jesus and he turns to them and he said gee you folks are swell you're all so wonderful just as you are don't change a thing uh, if he was a politician he would probably know how to butter him up pretty good wouldn't he and that the whole point of, of, of that and maybe if he had a, a big giant church he'd know how to butter him up so turning to them he said if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Do you ever notice, and I've, I've said this many times before, we've got, a, we've got a sign there outside of our church, we've got a sign right over here. Jesus says all sorts of things you just cannot put on the sign outside your church. In have you ever felt yourself like I've got to reinterpret Jesus to make him more acceptable to my culture? Like Jesus is standing there, and I'm happy to be with Jesus, I'm smiling, and he says, you've got to hate your mother and father, your wife, your kids, and you've got to love me. And What he really meant was, <laughs> you ever feel that? Because I, I do. Now, what Jesus is saying is absolutely brutal. 
but it doesn't mean exactly the same thing that you might think it means. Because everywhere in the Bible, Jesus is saying that we're supposed to love others. You're supposed to honor your father and mother. Parents don't embitter your children. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Uh, and then you think, well, I can't stand my parents. Well, Jesus said, love your enemies, you know. And, and I don't even know my wife anymore. She's like a stranger. Jesus said, love your neighbor, right? So you're stuck, okay? You're supposed to love one another. In fact, I would say if you're loving Jesus more, you will love other people more. But Jesus is saying, and this, this has to sting, and I don't want to take the sting out of this, that you're supposed to love him so much that by comparison, your other relationships are hatred. It's, it's a degree of, of love, what it is. You're supposed to put him so central that he is the thing that matters most. And I, We talked about this just last week. Using business, using our uh, money, using popularity, even using our spouse as an excuse not to get close to Jesus Christ. Uh, hiding behind your wife's skirts or, or saying, well, my man really doesn't want me to be that involved in church and so hiding from what God's will is. Jesus says, you put me first. When I say that this morning, it's difficult for me. And it's difficult for you guys. And, you're, and I think a lot of us, our gears are probably running right now. How does this not say what I think it says? How does this not say what Jesus... Do you think that everybody heard that in that crowd? Do you think that huge crowd of people went, oh, Honey, isn't that wonderful? Did you think that just hit everybody and they felt real comfortable with what he was saying? What if Jesus didn't want to make them comfortable? What, was that? what if that was the point? If anyone comes to me and not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And again, hatred here, we're talking about love. We're loving God more than anything. By comparison, I'm not going to hold on to my life. I'm giving it up for Jesus Christ. I'm not going to hold on to these things. I'm giving them up for Jesus Christ. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, in Roman culture, a criminal was made to carry his own cross. That's why Jesus had to carry his own cross to his crucifixion. And what Jesus is talking about is this radical rejection by our culture and by our world. He's saying, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to follow me, you better be ready to be rejected. You better be w ready to carry the weight of being rejected by our culture. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough to complete it? Count the cost. You've heard me say this before. We often sell a version of Christianity that says, come to church, come to our youth group. We've got a lot of free pizza. We've got a lot of fun. We've got a lot of, we've got a lot of things for the kids. We've got, we're selling them on different aspects, different aspects. And Jesus says something very different. He says, before you come to me, you better count the costs because it's a big thing to give your heart to me. It's a big thing to surrender your life to me. The world will reject you. Are you ready for that? Jesus Christ would have made a lousy politician. He would have made a lousy televangelist. He would have been very, very poor at marketing. <laughs> He's got a big crowd following him, and he tells them what they don't want to hear, what probably was very difficult for them to hear. Your own direction, your own plans, your own dreams, your own will for your life, you better count the cost because you're going to lose it all if you decide to follow me. If you have, <laughs> you better sit down, and you better think about this and count the cost and see if you have enough money to follow through. If you lay the foundation and are not, ab not able to finish it, everyone who sees will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Uh, there could be a financial cost for following Christ. There could be a cost in popularity. People might not think you're quite as cool as they used to. 
People, people might think you're a little strange now. Why are you so, being so religious? You better count the costs before you get into this because it's a big commitment. And then look at 31. It gets even worse. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. And to help you understand this, I want you to think you are the king of your life. The other king here is God. And you are at war with God. Okay? When, when God is not the king of our life, we're at war with him. We're fighting with God over who gets to decide what is right and wrong in our lives. When one king is about to go to war with another king, won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he is going to send a delegation while the other king is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. And when you ask for terms of peace in the ancient world, it means I surrender, you're now the boss of me. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I want you to think about this. Do you think you can fight with God? If you can't fight with God, you better go make terms for peace. And when you take terms for peace, what you're saying is, I'm no longer the boss here. You are the boss of my life. I'm surrendering to you. And then look what Jesus says. In the same way as a king surrendering to a greater king, in the same way, those of you who did not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. If we're not willing to give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. So that's why, you know, there's no such thing as a Sunday morning Christian. I'll be a Christian on Sunday morning. Uh, don't care about God the rest of my life. There's, there's no, the, true Christianity is not a nice, comfortable, precious moments, white picket fence thing that we can just do on our spare time. Well, I, I, I want to be religious. I kind of like the songs we sing, or I kind of like to... That's Jesus Christ saying, I want a full commitment here. He's very, he's very demanding. I, I always think, who does he think he is, God? He, he demands. He comes into our life. And have you ever noticed how, if you have a baby, they come into your life and suddenly they think the world revolves around them. Well, you know what? It's supposed to. They're, they are part of the family. And you're thinking, you're just new. And they're saying, I've been here all my life, you know. <laughs> God, I mean, God's not a baby, but he's got this same mentality. God says, it's all about me. And you, if I said that, it'd be arrogant. If you said that, it'd be arrogant, right? It's all about me. Because why? Because we're not God. God says, you better get your lives into alignment around me. You are now going to orbit me. I'm going to be the sun. I'm going to be the center of your universe. And God demands that. Jesus is incredibly demanding. He says, if you want, want to be my disciple, you have to give up everything. Now, the parallel passage in, in Matthew chapter 10, 37 through 39 says, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life is going to lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. My life, it's all about my plans, my hopes, my dreams. What can I get out of it? You're going to lose it. Jesus says, but if you lose yourself, <laughs> if you lose your life in me, you're going to find true life. Now, about that tower, the Clark, Adam Clark commentary said, this parable represents the absurdity of those who undertook to be a disciple of Christ without considering what difficulties they were to meet with and what strength they had to en enable them to go through the undertaking. He that will be a true disciple of Jesus Christ shall require no less than the mighty power of God to support him as both hell and heaven will unite to destroy him. When you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, guess what? Hell puts a target on your back. Because Satan, his fallen angels, they don't care how, what you're doing, how you're living. They don't care if you're a nice person or a mean person. They don't care you know, whether you, whether, what, what you're doing in your life, as long as they've got you, as long as you're not helping the kingdom of God. But as soon as you start saying, I'm going to live for Jesus, then the enemy is going to come against you. And this world is going to come against you. And they're going to try to dissuade you 
and, be, and convince you from following Jesus Christ and your life, actually your physical life can be endangered through following Jesus Christ. And in the United States, we don't face that. But at the time this was written, and throughout most of Christian history, in most places in the world, it has been physically dangerous to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of physical danger, through the centuries, Christians have been sharing their faith with other people. We have incredible freedom, incredible wealth, incredible ease, incredible spare time that has never been seen before in the history of the world. Christians have never had it like we have it. And are we, what are we doing to advance the kingdom of God? When Jesus says a Christian, a disciple must be willing to surrender everything, what does that look like in our context? What does it look like in my context? A king going to war, Jesus says, sit down and you think about this. You better surrender to God in the inferences before he destroys you. In this surrender, it means you are defeated. That's the point. I'm defeated. I surrender because I don't think I can survive this encounter. I don't think I can fight with you, Lord. Surrender means total, absolute giving up of authority. I am no longer the one in command. I no longer rule. He rules. He will take us and our possessions as his own. That's why Jesus concludes with verse 33. So then, none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. Jesus, in fact, was saying, I'm that king that you better surrender to. Now, I've seen people trying to nullify Christ's words in two ways. And maybe you're more creative than I am. Maybe you can think of other ways. But there's primarily two ways that people try to nullify what Christ was saying. One is to say that the message was limited to a certain time. Christ's words are not meant for us because the early Christians suffered so that we would not have to. I've heard Christians say this. Oh, they suffered so that we don't have to now. The problem is that's certainly not true. More Christians today are being persecuted for their faith than at the time in the first and second, third <laughs> centuries. Christians today are being killed literally by the thousands because of their faith in Christ. The problem is nothing in the text, not the immediate text or anywhere else in the Bible for that matter, indicates that these words had a time limit, that they were just for the early believers and the not us. That's bad exegesis. That's a bad way to interpret Scripture. Jesus wasn't saying this is just true for that crowd that is following him, or just true for the first couple generations of Christians. There was no time limit. And secondly, and I've also heard Christians say this, they've argued, that Jesus is only talking about super-Christians. If you want to be a super-Christian, you've got to be willing to deny yourself and take up your cross. But everybody else, you can just check a box and skate along. Well, the Bible never talks about this skate of the long option. You know, the whole New Testament, we, we talk again and again about this commitment to the Lord, commitment to his will. And then Christians talk about this check-a-box, just glide option. And it's not there. It's not there anywhere. Uh, speaking about super Christians, not regular believers. Somebody's calling me because they don't know I'm a pastor, apparently. Uh, there is no such thing as a super Christian. I've never met a super Christian. Uh, they say these are not regular believers. His message, again, was limited to a certain audience. So one is limited to time. One is limited to certain super believers. But the problem with that is Jesus turns around and gives his message to the entire crowd, not just his 12 apostles. He meant this for everybody. And it's in the scriptures. And it's, it's not indicated in the scripture that this is mentioned for some sort of spiritual elite, some sort of spiritual, uh, you know, uh, Air Force Ranger or something, the Navy SEAL. This is for everybody, not just the spiritually elite. God is calling all of us to a high standard, a high level of commitment. So here's the really bad news. Honestly, I don't see an escape. I mean, we want to 
try to escape from Christ's words. But I don't, I don't see one. It seems like, honestly, it seems like Christ is, one, calling us to passionately love him more than anything else, and two, be radically committed to his cause more than anything else. Our love for him, our commitment to him, beyond our love and commitment to anything on earth. And, and you know, he doesn't just say job. He says parents, spouses, kids. This is in, pro, in conflict with the so-called prosperity gospel, right? This is in conflict with this idea. We all know the prosperity. Come to Jesus and you will find health, wealth, and welfare. Your, spouses, your spouse and your kids will be perfect and never break your heart again. All your bills will be paid. You will be attractive, popular, and rich. After all, God don't make no junk and his children should live like royalty. Have you ever heard that? You're, God is the king, right? We're his kids. That makes prince and princess. Um, sorry, Dwayne, I meant to point at your wife when I said princess. <coughs> uh, and, and, it, and you know what? That's absolutely true. We are children of the king. Uh, we're, part of his, we're a royal priesthood. We're part of his family. But this idea that that means in this life we're never going to face adversity that's absolutely false. In fact, there's different sources of adversity. In this life, we can have adversity from the devil. We can have adversity from the world. We can have adversity from our own fallen self. Well, if you're not following Jesus, you still have the same adversity as Christians do. You can still get sick. You can still have you know, uh, emotional distress. You can still have financial trouble. But if you're following Jesus, then you have added trouble. That's why Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. So I've got the prosperity preacher on the one hand saying, if you're, if you're a Christian, you're not going to have any troubles. And I've got Jesus, the, you know, the one who died for me, who's God incarnate, saying, in this life, you will have trouble. And I've got to choose which one I'm going to believe. Because if I follow this guy and believe this guy, I'm going to be disappointed my whole life. Because when my life's not working out, what am I going to think? Maybe I'm not a true child. It's all on me. I don't have enough faith. Or maybe God doesn't love me enough. Well, I hate the false gospel because the good gospel is so wonderful. The good gospel is so good. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He loves us. He's coming into our lives. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. He's preparing heaven for us. He said, I will be with you in this life. The good gospel is so good. I'm not going to change it in for something the devil is selling. The devil is selling a false gospel. Who's going to buy from him? Do you think he likes you? Do you think it's going to work out for you? The prosperity gospel is no gospel at all and is right in conflict with the words of Christ. Now, some people might ask, Pastor, why give this sermon? Don't you know it makes some folks uncomfortable? I really only have one response. Why did Jesus say to the crowds, right? Why did he say to the crowds that had begun to follow him around, whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Didn't Jesus know that his words might make some people uncomfortable? Didn't he realize that some people might stop following him on Facebook and Twitter and if he stopped saying cutesy, funny things and started dealing with eternal matters, seriously, and again, I said this already, be, be honest with yourself. Do you ever feel like Jesus, you need to translate for him? Or, no, 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 he didn't really mean that. I'm going to tell you what, what he really meant. Or, or you maybe think, maybe Jesus is just naive. Like he doesn't get how scary his words are. <laughs> Maybe Jesus is just naive. He doesn't understand that that hurts our feelings. That his words are offensive. I'm ashamed to say that sometimes I do that. I get to a text and I think, start thinking, okay, now how can I make this sting my little backside a little less? Because I'm averse to my backside. 
uh, being stung. Sometimes I do. You know, I don't want to exaggerate. Not a lot, not all the time, but sometimes. And I catch myself thinking, wow, Jesus, you just ticked off all those important people. You know you didn't have to say it that way. I think I could have been a little more diplomatic. Wow. What kind of a fool would say to the living God, I think I could have did a little better than you? Or, why did you say it like that, Jesus? That probably hurt some people's feelings. We're nice. Couldn't you have been more gentle? And Jesus says, listen, dude. Listen, Dan. I love those folks more than you. You going to trust me? I knew what I was doing. I love them, and I want them, and I want their wife, and I want their parents, and I want their kids to be with me in heaven, and they're going to spend eternity with these people, and they are going to be filled with joy, but they've got to put me first. They've got to lay aside everything that can hold them back. They've got to come to me. I I was imagining this week, imagine if you were one of the disciples. Large crowds, right? That's what we want, large crowds. Let's pack out the place. Large crowds are gathering, and Jesus is not sitting in a nice, you know, warm in the winter, air conditioned in the, in the summer building. He's out there walking with all the dust and the nature and the pollen and, and the sun beating down and the rain falling down. But large crowds and people are hanging on every word Christ speaks. This is like, feels like a movement, right? A movement, something important is happening. People are willing to stand out in all the elements and skip meals just to hear Christ preach. Well, I think they're really committed, don't you? Jesus says, I'm going to ratchet it up a bit. Turn to the crowds. You guys have to love me more than your spouses, more than your kids, more than your parents, more than life itself. Of course, the crowd eats it up when he goes after the rich. Yeah! Jesus did that a lot, didn't he? When he goes after the religious elites, yeah, we hate those religious, self-righteous do-gooders. crowd loves that stuff. They follow him anywhere. And suddenly, this large crowd is following him around. Maybe they're hungry, and they're thinking, we've given up a lot to be with this teacher. And he turns to them, and what is he going to say? You're one of the apostles there. What's he going to say? This dramatic moment. He turns, not... Not just seat, sitting down and everybody is there to, to receive the message. He turns to them while he's walk, walking. What is he going to say that's going to increase the crowds even more? What is he going to say that's going to increase the prestige? And you're Peter or you're Matthew or John or Andrew. And what goes through your mind when you hear him say, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, children, Brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And do your eyes like nervously look around the crowd real quick? Whoa, how, how is the crowd taking this? When people start to fold their arms, when people start shaking their head, sigh, murmur, you see people go like this to one another, kind of look back at Jesus, get agitated, maybe you see start, people start to leave. And your eyes catch the other apostles. And silent, you're saying, what is, what, does, what is he doing? We've got something important here. We're going to change the culture here. We've got momentum. We've got crowds. They're committed to him. They're following him out without food in the, all the elements. And now he's driving them away. Jesus doesn't know what he's doing. Come on, be honest. Jesus doesn't know what he's doing, right? That's a temptation to think, to feel. Jesus, don't you know that we need numbers if we're going to change the culture? Jesus, don't you know we need more people to give bigger offerings? Jesus, I know you love to preach about the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you rather speak to large throngs of people rather than dwindling number of people? And I wonder if it hit any of the apostles at the time. Because, you know, we know that later they get it. Later they get it. Most of them end up dying for their faith in Christ. But I wonder if any of the apostles, his elite, his core guys, I wonder if they understood it at the time. Wait. Wait. What's going on here? Jesus would rather have a handful of true believers than a huge mob 
only following him to share in the excitement or to see miracles or to get a free lunch. What? Jesus would rather have a few people who truly loved him more than anything else over a crowd of fair-weather fans. Jesus is looking for true followers who would give up anything for God instead of masses of people who follow him as long as it's easy or fashionable to do so. Jesus would rather have one disciple over a vast crowd there for the show. So many things can knock us off stride, right? Somebody pulls in front of us when we're driving. Somebody quickly darts in, takes that parking spot. I remember I was in Japan once, and I was getting in line at the grocery store, pushing my little cart, and, and this old gal gets right up in front of me, goes like this, and turns around and goes, <laughs> and looks me in the eye. And because I'm ornery, I said, ah, I, those are, those are, those are, and, which means, sure, go ahead. And the cashier and the other people laughed, and she went like this, ah, sumasen, which means, oh, I'm very sorry for my rudeness. <laughs> <laughs> Things knock us off our stride. The color, the color of the carpet, the sound of the worship team, the preacher's voice, the person's hairdo is sitting in front of us or behind us, somebody else's singing voice. We, we find so many things to get ticked off and make a big deal about. And Christ said, I told you to give up everything, all of it, for me. And we're so skilled at claiming all these things for ourselves and claiming the right to be ticked off and bent out of shape and hold grudges and, and hold on to bitterness and, and to tear down the work of Christ because it's all about us. And Jesus say, no, it's all about me and you are wrong. Jesus would have rather have one disciple over a vast crowd there for the show. You know what? I'm preaching today, but I don't know this. I don't know it. I know it up here. Christ is trying to teach me to know it right here. I think I'm learning, but I'm a slow study. Jesus has got to work on his hands when it comes to me. But I'm not going to argue with him about what he said. I'm going to say, Jesus, you're right. Lord God, help me. Jesus, you are right. Lord God, help me. I'm, I don't want to fight with you. Many years ago, uh, this is a cool thing. And, and I'm glad this happened in my life. I was blessed to have the opportunity to speak with, with uh, a martyr. Uh, his name was Richard Wormbrandt. And uh, he's not my, he wasn't my friend. I didn't get to know him intimately, but I had a nice conversation with him. He came and spoke at, at, the, at the college where I was at, Moody Bible Institute. And I thought everybody would go to the reception afterwards. And I went to the reception. There was only like 20 or 30 people, as I remember it. And people were hanging around him, and they quickly dwindled off and... I thought, I'm shy, but I thought, I've got to do this. I've got to talk to this man. And we had a good talk, and, and he was, I remember I was ashamed of my lack of faith, but I was inspired to have more faith. I remember that he was imposing. He seemed very tall in my eyes. I don't know if that's true or not, but he just had such a presence because he endured persecution for Christ, and there was a certainty and a confidence about him that really, really spoke to me. Uh, he was a Romanian, Romanian pastor. He was founder of the international ministry Voice of the Martyrs, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, I met him just a few years before his death. He was an old man at the time in his mid-80s, but straight and confident, and his story is amazing, and you can read about it. He's written uh, over a dozen books, but his book, Tortured for Christ, very powerful book. I've read it a couple times. He didn't grow up as a Christian. But he became a Christian in a country dominated by communism. So I guess you could say he counted the cost. He knew it was going to be bad for his future. He knew it was going to be a difficult thing to become a Christian. So he, as a young man, along with his young, beautiful bride, the love of his life, became believers, which was a dangerous thing for them to do in communist Romania. In fact, not only did his faith affect his life, his wife wrote a book called Wife of a Preacher or something like that. She ended up in a prison camp for three years of hard labor because of her husband. So his decision to have faith affected his, chil his child and his wife. He was arrested many times. Once he was thrown into solitary confinement 
for three years. He said the, 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 the guards would wear felt on the bottom of their boots so they would drive you crazy by lack of noise. He didn't see other prisoners, but they communicated by Morse code. He said each night he'd, he'd make up sermons in his mind in the pitch black just so he could keep his mind from going insane. After being released from prison, after eight and a five, at one point eight and a half years in prison, they let him go and they commanded him, now you stop preaching. I think it would have been easy to stop preaching. He could have told himself, I paid my dues. I've been faithful to the Lord. Time for the younger guys. The guys who haven't been in prison yet. Time for them to step up. My wife needs me. My son needs me. I have to take care of her. Let someone else share the gospel for a while. Wouldn't that have been easy? Well, he didn't obey the government. He kept on preaching. That reminds me of Acts chapter 5. Remember the Jewish ruling council of the Sanhedrin commanded the apostles to stop preaching. They replied, should we obey human beings rather than God? Now I want you to think, does the fact that Pastor Wormbrandt kept preaching mean that he despised his wife or his child? That he didn't care what happened to them? No. Not at all. He loved them dearly, but it did mean that he loved Christ more, that he put God first. It didn't mean he didn't love his family. It didn't mean he put Christ and his mission before everything else. He was arrested again. Big surprise, right? A few years later, and he was arrested again a few years later, and this time he was sentenced to 25 years in jail. And he was made to endure extreme psychological and physical torture. He was beaten so badly that the skin, the muscle, was worn away so you could see his bones in places. He was shocked with electricity. During this time, his wife and children were told by the government. And one time, the government came to them officially and said, your husband has died. Another time, they paid lowlifes to come and say, we were in prison with your husband, and he's dead. How rotten. You know, if you're, if you're the government and you're doing that, you are bad guys. <laughs> you know, don't even imagine that you're doing this for the good of anybody. Finally, the Romanian government, because they were bad guys, uh, some foreigners from Norway got involved, and they raised some money, and they bribed the government, <laughs> and he got released from prison. Uh, Pastor Wormbrandt made his way through Europe, through Norway, uh, to the United States, and he ended up before the U.S. Senate, a subcommittee, where he gave a report on the state of Christianity behind the Iron Curtain, you know, behind the communist countries of Eastern Europe. And he took off his shirt for the Senate, and there were TV crews there, and there was just a mass of scars all over his body. The Senate gasped. And he actually became a well-known figure in the United States and then around the world. Uh, and he committed himself to being a voice for persecuted Christians. He founded Voice of the Martyrs. I saw on an online poll that was taken in Romania in 2006. He was voted as the fifth greatest Romanian ever. So I met the fifth greatest Romanian ever. He was just behind two emperors, the R Romania's national poet and a prince. He was ahead of Vlad Tepes, a.k.a. Dracula, who came in at number 12, and uh, Nikolai Ceausescu, who, if you know anything, was the decades-long, long-time uh, communist, brutal dictator, leader of Romania, who came in at 11. So he came in at number 5. The guy who imprisoned him came in at 11. Uh, I'm proud and very glad that I ch chanced to meet this guy. Just a short conversation, went back to my dorm room and wept. And I, I think, you know, part of the reason I'm here today, the long dominoes of things that happen in your life, I think he was part of those dominoes that evening down in Chicago. Brothers and sisters, do you know it's good to be strengthened and encouraged by the example of others living out their faith? It's good. And, and we should allow it. We shouldn't be so calloused. Callous, being cynical and callous, that's for the world. Lord God, please soften our hearts with your Holy Spirit. We don't want that. And we should be people, such people, that we can be encouraged and strengthened by the examples of other believers living out their faith. 
Courage is contagious. When one person stands up, it's easier for other people to stand up. We must become courageous and contagious Christians. We had a situation in church this week where one family visited another family, and both families ended up with strep throat. I'll tell you what, wouldn't it be so wonderful if one family visits another family this week, and that family becomes a Christian because our faith is contagious, that wherever we go, we share Jesus Christ. We need to be Christians who are bringing people to Christ that are sharing the gospel of Christ, that are sharing the love of God, not our own nasty attitudes. You know, the world's not blessed by Dan Wolf's nasty attitude. The world is full of nasty attitudes. I don't need the Holy Spirit to bring a nasty attitude. That's an amen, right? Amen, yeah. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit to work through us. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, show a short video now. And it, because I've been watching videos for years of Christians in other parts of the world, we're a small church. I think it's important for us to watch the faith of other believers in action. And I want us to be encouraged by this and strengthened by this. Remember we saw the video of the guys, I think it was Papua New Guinea, who weren't wearing much clothes. Does that ring a bell? And, and they got uh, Bibles, and they were weeping to get Bibles for the first time. It was their treasure. And we talked about how we should love our Bibles more and love the Word of God more. Well, this is a short video. Again, over the years, I've shown us videos of Christians in other parts of the world. We're going to continue to do that. I think it's important for us to do that. And we're going to be, I'm just going to speak briefly after the video. I was thinking that I would show a video about Christians facing fierce persecution in the Middle East. Uh, you know, believers having their heads cut off, run out of their homes, uh, shot for their faith in the Middle East. Or maybe a video about rural Chinese farmers or North Korean Christians. North Korea has the worst persecution in the world, the worst than any Muslim country. Uh, facing poverty as well. And we're probably going to see some of those videos. In fact, I'm sure uh, if the Lord tarries, God willing, we're going to see some of those videos later on. But today... I went with a video of a simple Chinese businessman, just a regular guy, and he hasn't even faced persecution yet. Isn't that funny? For today's message, I chose a video about a guy who has not faced persecution yet, but he has friends who have. And I want to show you this video for a couple reasons. One, this is cool. He was introduced to Jesus while on a business trip overseas. And I want this thought to encourage us to be bold in sharing our faith. You never know where you plant a seed, what's going to come of it. So he's introduced to Jesus while overseas, and now he's helping lead other people to Christ in China. I I heard recently that we have all these college ministries. On every campus, there's Christians trying to reach internationals. And, And a lot of Chinese people are becoming saved. And then they go back, and we all pray, Lord, please help them keep their faith. We don't know what's happening. And I heard... uh, from a Chinese man saying that there's many churches in China that are started by young people who got saved at American colleges and went back to China and started churches. God is winning. So share your faith with your business partners, with the people you work with, with your friends at school. You don't know where that seed's going to go. And the second reason I want to share this video is he illustrates Christ's call to radical faith because even though he hasn't been persecuted yet, he understands he could face serious physical and financial consequences for sharing his love for Christ. And that would have a major ramification, major ramifications for his wife and his child. And yet still, he is going forward. Still, he chooses to share the gospel anyways. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.